And, but before we get to Luke, I just want to read some ground uh, scriptures. And again, the whole point to this is to learn how to be during the pause. How to be, how to be. And, um, and so one of the, uh, oh, I'm in the wrong area. One of the passages that came out last week came from uh, one of our, our young adults. Her name is Lydia Giuliano. Is Lydia here? Oh, she had to go to work. So um, Lydia read uh, a passage, and I'm going to read it. And this is, this is really the strength of our, our teaching today and then our practice. And it was Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. I want you to find it in your, on your phone, in your Bible. Get used to that. That's why we're doing all this reading, so that we get comfortable reading the heart of the Father. God's opinion, God's opinion, it says it's a lamp unto my feet, it's a light to my path. The word of God is alive. And this is what the passage, this is what the passage reads. I'll read this to you. And this is, this is Luke chapter, let me get to my stuff. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Here we go. You got it? All right, so let me have you. Oh, they have it up top. Okay, okay, we're good, we're good. So look, Luke 10, 38, look what he says. And Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem. They came, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha, everybody say Martha, welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary, everybody say Mary, sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. The Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. It's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken. This is family now. You got Mary, you got Martha, and you've got her brother, actually, Lazarus. But as we go through this journey, I thought this is a really cool passage to unpack on how we fast how we read scriptures throughout the day, how we quiet ourselves, but what's the point behind it? Are we doing it for a ritual? Are we fasting just because it's a good parallel to my New Year's resolution that I want to lose weight? Why are we fasting? We're learning how to be with the Lord, but it can get complicated because our culture is constantly moving so fast And there are things that we have to do. So Pam and I wanted to talk to you today just so we could live it out. We could talk about how how do we do this now? What's our mindset as we go through this? And so we'll go back and forth. That's how we are when we we do our teaching style. And so, sweetie, why don't you share what came up early in the week that we were were talking about from the Lord? Yeah, first I want to share a, a side note before I get started is that it's important for you to talk to somebody about what you're reading and going through during the week. Because some of this came out as uh, Pastor Terry and I were just talking. I mean, we were in the bedroom getting dressed, fixing the bed, and we were just talking about the scripture. And all of a sudden, revelation started coming out to both of us. But it was because we had already taken time prior to quiet and listen, and then we got to speak out and share them with each other. And things tend to come out that way. Um, Isolation is is never really good. Um, But sharing, finding someone to share with, you have a friend, someone you can call. Pastor Terry's talking about husband and wife, but not everybody is husband and wife, but someone who you can connect with to talk about the word. And and let me just say that for the husband and wife, you know, because we do think that, you know, marriage is strength for our nation. And it's strength for the body of Christ. And all the other relationships can flow from that. 
And sometimes that gets so complicated. And we have so much arguing and tension and things happening in marriage. So it's important, it's important. Talk about the word of God all the time. You don't have to open scripture up to do it. You don't have to sit down and say, okay, let's have our time with we, God. We didn't no. have any Bibles in We didn't have any Bibles. No, we were just talking about part of the scripture. It's just remembering the Father's heart. And then out of it, our path comes. The same things, and this is family. This is it's important that we, we create a family dynamic, whether your family is husband, wife, children, or brother, sister, or friendships can be your family. Um, and so we feel the exact same way for our son Jordan. Our son Jordan is in the house this morning. He gets to serve at Christ Community, and then he comes here from time to time, so he's here. And so we talk to him. He talks to us. He says, this is how I'm handling my fast. Jordan's 25. And so this isn't in a, you know, big, old, middle-aged adult, all of that. This is life with everyone. And the more you do it, the more it creates a climate in your family. Thanks, sweetie. So go, going back to the scripture, um, we've probably all read it before, but if you just heard it this morning, sometimes we might think, and I've done this, is that you think about Mary and Martha, and the lesson you come away with is be like Mary, but don't be like Martha. But what we were talking about when we were talking about the scripture was that we don't think Jesus was really addressing the fact, so much the fact that Mary was at his feet and Martha was busy getting stuff done. Because I'm a doer. I'm like, well, dinner had to be prepared, right? Somebody had to do it. You know, the, the, the food, and back then it was much more compl complicated. They had to kill the animals, clean the animals, cook the animals, make bread from scratch. So there was a lot that had to be done. So it always kind of bothered me that, that Martha got the, the raw end of the deal in our thinking about this scripture. But what we talked about is that G we don't think Jesus was so much addressing that she was doing the things that she was doing. He was addressing the fact that she was distracted and that she was anxious and that she was upset. So the distraction and being worried and being upset is what Jesus was addressing. Because we have to do, but we don't have to do it distracted and worried and upset. And what that comes from is practicing being in his presence, which is all that we're talking about and moving into and leaning into in this time of fasting and beyond, but concentrating now in this three weeks of fasting. Um, we need to have the daily activities. We got to do stuff. Mom's got to take care of the kids. You got to go to work, whatever it is you have to do. But you can have peace when you learn to be in his presence. That makes sense? So I want to share with you. Is okay if I, you want to? So my daughter-in-law, daughter well, first of all, I love the way that they're raising their family. My oldest son, Ryan, and his wife, Emily, have a five-year-old, Melody, and they've been all doing the fast together. Um, they haven't asked her to fast food because she doesn't, she doesn't get that. But she's fasting some of the programs that she watches on her iPad. She's only allowed to watch certain things. You know, you have to feel it. So <laughs> she's kind of feeling that. But I want to read you the testimony that she sent. And I want you to listen carefully because there's so many pieces in here. I want you to remember also as you're hearing this, this is a five-year-old child, Okay. So here's, it. here's what she sent us in the text. First, she apologized for the long text, so I apologize in advance. I wanted to share something cool that Melody has experienced the last few days. We decided that this fast would mostly focus on creating a different family environment centered on his word and presence. Because of Mel's age, we didn't have her fast a meal, but she's fasting TV shows and giving up TV time. She can only watch God-centered shows during the next 21 days. We've also been having dinner at the table and doing devotionals and scripture reading, reading night at, after dinner. This past Tuesday, I sat with her on her bed and showed her how to practice stillness and hearing God's voice. She breathed in the Holy Spirit, and she breathed out anxiety, worry, and fear. We did that a few times, and then I asked her to visualize what Jesus was saying, saying, speak to me, Jesus. 
She then stayed quiet for about a minute. When she was done, I asked her if she heard anything, and she said, I felt Jesus moving in my heart, touching it, and he said, don't be afraid. God is with you. She later practiced it again on her own after doing something she wasn't supposed to do. She came to me and said, Mommy, I did stillness again, and then I felt my heart beating, and Jesus said, You are my good child. You always listen to me, and you are in my heart. A five-year-old. The next day, she was having some anxiety at school with some reading. Mel said she stopped practice stillness, and then she felt Jesus touch her and said, you are a child of God and you can do everything in my eyes. She practiced stillness. And it didn't take a long time. She was only introduced to it. And I think there's something to do with being a child and she doesn't have a lot of baggage maybe to get out of the way. So we might need a little more practice to move some baggage out of the way. But when you practice stillness, you can hear him in the busyness of what you have to do. You may have an extremely busy day, but you've already practiced the presence. And you can always just stop for a moment and realize that his presence is with you and ask him what you need. She had a problem with reading, and he said, you can do this. And in essence, he said, you got this. You don't have a reading problem. You got this. So can't we all take the example of a five-year-old and practice how to be still and have his presence with us so that we can do and so that we can do even more powerfully the things that he has to do for us? Is that an amazing testimony? You know, uh, on on Thursday, I was, every Thursday, you know, Ryan cuts my hair. So I was over there, over their house and Ryan's cutting my hair. And, um, and so we just started having a conversation. I said, yeah, I heard that thing that you sent us uh, about Mel. She said, they said, yeah, you know, there are times when, because she's sort of like a little perfectionist. And so here's this five-year-old wanting to do things right. The teacher is saying certain things. She wants to line things up just perfect. And when she doesn't, she gets so frustrated. But because in the house, they started introducing even to her how to quiet yourself and hear God. It started working for a five-year-old. And none of what we're sharing are we sharing because, you know, we've got this perfect family. We don't. We're very, there are no titles. There is no, oh, you know, they're, they're God's favorites. Nothing like that. We have to work at what we do. And that's why we wanted to introduce this picture of being alone with God during this 21-day fast so that when we're living for God, Oh, man, it's not based on performance. Say it again. It's based on presence. It's based on presence. But it's hard to understand what presence is like. So that's what this is. And we're not doing it for 21 days. And typically after 21 days, like, oh, thank God the fast is over. I can eat. (laughs) No. We're trying to teach a lifestyle of how to be like Joseph, how to be like Esther, how to be like young Daniel, how to be a businessman like Nehemiah, how to be, how to be like Mary, or how to be like Paul when he missed it and he blew it, right? How to, how to be like, like uh, Peter where he denied Jesus right to his face. How do I get this back? And so Jesus, in stillness with Peter, recreated the same environment. And he said, now you denied me three times. I want you to affirm me out loud three times. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me? That happened in stillness with Jesus. And even though Jesus isn't here physically, he has given us his spirit And we learn how to stay in tune with the Holy Spirit. And so we breathe him in. I want to read something to you that uh, Charles Spurgeon said, you know, noted, powerful, powerful teacher and preacher, you know, centuries ago. And this this is what he said here. He says, stillness, even for the purpose of rest or prayer, can feel like wasted time 
to someone who lives in a world that values wealth, competition, high productivity, full schedules, and general self-importance. This is what Charles says. He says, there are times when solitude is better than society, and silence is wiser than speech. We should be better Christians. Now, his, his language is a little old school, so let's just work with me in it. We should be better Christians if we were more alone, waiting upon God and gathering through meditation on his word, spiritual strength for labor in his service. We ought to muse upon the things of God because we thus get the real nutriment out of them. Why is it that some Christians, although they hear many sermons, make but slow advances in the divine life? Because they neglect their closets and do not thoughtfully meditate on God's word. They love the wheat, but they do not grind it. They would have the corn, but they will not go forth into the fields to gather it. The fruit hangs upon the tree, but they will not pluck it. The water flows at their feet, but they will not stop to drink it. From such folly, deliver us, O Lord. Our plan today is just to start a practice. And whether you're 80, 70, 60, woohoo! Um, 50, (laughs) 40, 30, 20, 15, 10, or like Sean this morning, eight. Doesn't matter how old you are. You could be like Melody, five years old. God says, I want to be with you. He's not this judge that's now looking and critiquing every part of what you do. He's saying, I want to be in relationship with you. And so we have to learn how to be. Why don't you talk to them a little bit about stillness? Yeah, one of the first things that that came to my mind as you were talking is for so many years, one of the, the lies that the enemy told me is that I didn't have time to do that. I'm like, well, you know what, my mind's so busy and it's going so fast. I don't have time to sit down and still myself. It's a lie of the enemy. Because I now think about Melody when she was in her bed and her mom was talking to her. She had those, what, five, ten minutes before she went to bed to just even begin to practice that. I personally think that as you practice it, it grows, and you, you, you t- we tend to find time for the things that are most important to us. But if it's something that you haven't practiced, you have to start with getting rid of the lie that you don't have the time to do it. Because even if it just starts with a few minutes, I think that there are few exceptions that, that are, that exist, that say, I don't have time to learn how to be still with the Lord. We were created for him. He more wants to be with us than he wants us to do for him. So I think that's a great place to start. So practicing stillness. One of the, we have a sort of a, a, a checklist, if you will. Um, and Javier, do you have that if you would put that up so we can kind of follow along with what, what it looks like and how to practice stillness. And if you haven't before, um, write this down. Take a picture as everything comes up. And go back to it. Don't just assume that you're going to remember. Um, you can go back to the, the YouTube. But if you have it right in front of you, that just, that's just one less barrier that you have to get through. If something else you have to do to get to your information. So how to practice stillness. I'm sorry, I don't have my notes. No, I got them. So the first thing is settle into a comfortable and quiet place. 
Now, I understand that sometimes, and I'm on the top of my list is moms with kids. I know sometimes that's a hard thing to do. But you know what someone told me, a mom one day, she said, and I know sometimes this is hard too because they're knocking on the bathroom door, go in the bathroom. Um, get out of the house and sit in the car. But, and even if it's a closet, really just find that quiet, comfortable place to be. So the first is, the next is, take a few deep breaths. Practice that now with me. Everybody breathe in real deep. And breathe out. So what, we're, what we can do with that breathing, because breathing is good, period. If you've ever been in an exercise kind of place and, you know, or if you've done meditation or whatever, they, we talk about breathing in and breathing out. But what we want to consider when we're doing breathing is that you're breathing in the presence. Now, we know we're not, that you're not literally taking in through your nose, but you're just visualizing, intaking the Holy Spirit into your body. So you breathe in, and you breathe in Holy Spirit. And when you're breathing out, you're breathing out anxiety and you're breathing out disappointment, and you're breathing out heaviness, and you're breathing out anger. And you do that a few times. You breathe in his presence, and then you let go of those things that are in the way. You take those deep breaths, and you allow yourself to ex inhale and exhale slowly. This might seem like a funny thing to do, but believe me, it gets you to a place of better consciousness. The next thing you do is begin with a simple prayer. It's just a phrase that expresses your openness to God and your desire to spend time with him. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's just you having a conversation with God. No King James Version speech and, and, and words. Just the way you would talk to anyone with, with honor and with respect Begin with a simple prayer or phrase that expresses, God, I'm just, I'm welcoming you into my space right now. I want to be with you. I want you to be with me. I want your presence to be on me. I want to experience your presence. Just speak to God as you would, just in a simple prayer. Um, you might use your favorite name for God, Abba, Daddy, Father, Jesus, whatever name represents that presence and represents God best to you. you. You can use that name in your prayer. The next is when distractions come. I use the word when because <laughs> distractions are going to come. And let me insert something as a little trick here. And this may, may help to start in the beginning. And this is something that I did that helped me a lot. Because if you're a doer and you have a list of things to get done and you have stuff that comes to your mind that you don't want to forget, put this aside, take your notepad or your phone, your iPad, and list out those things. It's OK. Start with listing out those things. Then it's settled. You know you can go back to them. You know you have them someplace. They don't have to jump into your mind. And so when those distractions come afterwards, they're going to come. <laughs> use that simple prayer that you came up with, that simple prayer that you use to talk to God, and then turn your thoughts back to him. And it's much easier to do if you've already put all of that stuff to the side. Does that make sense? And then give yourself lots of grace especially if you haven't done this before. And like Pastor Terry was talking earlier about fasting. If you were fasting and you went to a dinner and they had some really good something there that you enjoy or a dessert or some cookies and you had some, do not beat yourself up. If you go into this quiet time and you have 15 minutes before you have to get somewhere or do something, and you feel like you spent those 15 minutes just chasing away thoughts or just, you know, being distracted, don't get discouraged. Don't beat yourself up. Give yourself lots of grace and try again the next day. Do, do not give up. This, this is, it's countercultural. 
because I mean, even I've seen even commercials, people get up and they just start running. I saw one commercial where a guy got up, slipped his feet into some running shoes, and went out the door and just started you know, doing his morning jog. And that's the kind of culture that we live in. So it's okay to get up and put on your running shoes, but let the next step be to fall to your knees for a few minutes. It's, it's going to be pushing against what we see and what we, normally, what we normally even may do, right? So it's not necessarily going to be a walk in the park, but once you get the practice of it, you won't be able to leave it alone because then you'll be feeling and experiencing that presence and you'll be walking with it more during the day. And you'll be able to fill up with that so that when it's time to encounter the people that you encounter, you'll have something to overflow and give to them. Something of the presence of God will be on you in order to give to others. That, that stillness piece, it's, it's a practice. It's not a ritual. We're not making a doctrine out of stillness. What we're trying to do is help you to learn in the society and the culture that we're in how to spend time with God. There are times when I get on my knees and I pray. And then there are times when I don't get on my knees. There are times when I open my eyes and it's like, Lord, thank you for waking me up. And that's my, that's my statement. That's my phrase. Father, I love you. Thanks for waking me up again. Oh, I appreciate you so much. You know, you mean so much to me. These are just simple statements. And they don't have to be grandiose and dear Father God, holy in all your ways. No, we ain't got to go through all that. It's like, Dad, thank you. I love you, and I appreciate you. What do you want to say to me? What's in my heart that you want to build up? And what's in your heart for me that's fresh and new? So we're going to practice just a little bit, just a little bit of of being quiet before the Lord. And sometimes we think, quiet, oh, it's weird, it's quiet. I remember growing up in a church and the kid got up to, I, I used to do it. My mom had us all, the whole youth department, do recitations on Easter and Christmas and we'd stand up. And I remember so vividly <clears throat> that if one of the kids, you know, you know, missed their line or they got nervous and they got really quiet, it was just, you know, hard for the audience. And so everybody would start saying things like, hallelujah, hallelujah, bless you, Jesus. You know, why not just be practical? Hey, you can do it. You're doing a great job. That's, so we're not trying to introduce something churchy here. We just want it to be just real sweet and wonderful in his presence. And so I just want to bless you with that. But we're about to practice. We're going to practice to something that happened last week. I told you that Lydia, who read this passage of scripture, um, she was here, but she had to go off to work. Well, last week she did the same thing. She read scripture, and then she had to go off to work. And they reached out to me later in the middle of the week, and they said, man, listen to this song that Lydia found and shared a statement with the rest of the family. And when Pam and I heard the song, we were like, oh, man, what a great stillness song. And so we're going to use that song just as a launching pad of practicing how to be. And that's what this song is entitled, you know, just, just how to be, how to be with him. And so what I want you to do is I want you to lean forward on the pew in front of you. Just lean forward. This isn't nothing weird here. We're just trying to find the best way because, you know, not everybody can get on their knees. If you want to get on your knees, that's fine. But we're just going to, you know, use this. And just lean, lean on the, the pew in front of you. You know, put your head in your elbows or, you know, whatever it takes just to sort of quiet yourself. Yeah, can I add something? That finding that place and, and closing your eyes and leaning up the pew, some of that is so that you're not looking around and being distracted by the stuff that's going on around you. It just takes out one more piece that you kind of have to battle with and that closed eyes can begin that place of stillness and quiet for you. That's so good. Because at the end of the day, God hears you whether your eyes are open or not. He hears you while you're driving. Please don't close your eyes. <laughs> and so if you want to look at the stained glass windows, if you want to look at the, the Holy Spirit falling down in a heart, 
a guy who put that together. He drew that. I believe it was Holy Spirit inspired because it came from scripture. If you want to look at that, whatever you can get in your vision to just get that concern, that worry that Martha was filled with, get that out of the way. And so um, we're going to take probably maybe about four minutes, four or five minutes, the length of this song, and listen to the song while you're quieting yourself. You guys can play that.
thank you for your your promise that through Holy Spirit you will never leave us and you'll never forsake us. Nothing, as Brianna shared in your word, nothing can separate us from your love. And so as we start practicing this, just show us based on our own personalities, our own wirings. Maybe there are those of us that are walkers and as we're walking, we're being with you, Lord. Others are kneelers. And as we journal and as we we draw, as we sketch, as poems come up, as stories come up, As our past comes up and you heal us. As our hurts come up and you heal us. As direction comes, show us how to write it down. Show us how to just just be with you. We want to be with you. It's new for us, Lord, whether we're five, eight, 48, 28, 88. Show us that you have created us and we're so fearfully and wonderfully made. It's your design. And we don't have to have shame coming into your presence. Show us how to how to be with you, Lord. Thank you for everyone that's here, Lord. And For anyone who came in here or who's watching online, Lord, and they don't know you, we offer your wonderful plan of Jesus who showed us that his blood makes coming into your presence easy. We can walk right in with boldness because of your blood, because of your sacrifice, Jesus. And so for anyone that is like that, Lord, we make it available. All they have to do is say, Jesus, I believe you died for me. Jesus, I believe you shed your blood to forgive and wash away all of my sin. Jesus, I believe you were buried. And I want to give you my old life. Bury it. Raise me up like Jesus. You were raised up from the dead. I give myself to you. Just say that with all of your heart. Believe it in all of your heart. And the Father says, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. I will not shun anyone who comes to me. That's why I sent my son so that you can have my life. So thank you for your plan of salvation, Father. And may we, with these new who have come to Jesus, those who have recently come to Jesus, those who have been serving him for years, Lord, we all desire this stillness. Time to be with you. So when we have to be busy like Martha, with vision and planning, employment and family, even even when we're enjoying recreation, we want to do it knowing that you're with us. So help us this week, Father, as we practice learning to be with you. There's nothing we want more. Nothing we want more than to be with you. Thank you. So we bless you and we thank thank you for our time. We thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I just just want to give give you this word. I hear the Father saying as we were hearing that song and even singing that song. I hear the Father saying, I feel the same way about you. I just want to be with you. I, I want to touch you. I want to spend time with you. I want, j- just the way you're sitting at my feet, I want to come sit next to you. 
because that's how I feel about you. So he's saying as you go into those times, make sure you understand that it's not just you wanting to press in to be with him. He's pressing in to be with you. So good. So look, we're, I'm going to give it over to Pastor Pam. She's going to lead us as we wrap up our time together with our time of giving. And, um, and we're giving to the Lord because we're in relationship with him. This isn't something that's meant to bring shame. That's meant to bring guilt. It's meant to create an opportunity. Paul said, uh, you would have given, but you lacked opportunity. And so here is opportunity. Here's, here's the opportunity. 